A new coronavirus sub-variant. It's much more infectious than uh, earlier variants. A recent spike in local COVID cases. The mutations just keep on coming. Omicron BA1 and Omicron BA2. Which is believed to be the most mutated version of the virus to date. A new era of the pandemic began with Omicron in 2021 and the family is getting bigger. Omicron now has several sub-variants that are spreading all over the world. And it's these two that have people worried. That's because they're getting past some of our immune defences that we've built up. So even if you've been vaccinated or infected before, your protection isn't quite what it used to be. And this is why. Changes to the virus's spike protein when it mutates make it really good at getting past those defences. But viruses can't change or go anywhere without their hosts, us. And right now, because so many prevention measures have been wound back, experts say we're vulnerable to even more variants. Now, this doesn't mean we're back to square one. In fact, we're in a better position than ever to tackle the virus. Two years ago, we had no idea what was coming up ahead. 2020 was a public health emergency with no tools around to manage COVID, no vaccines, no treatments, very limited understanding of its transmission and a real risk for high death. Now we have vaccines, plenty of research, and we know what keeps the virus at bay. But even having those things doesn't mean we can totally ignore the virus altogether. Case numbers and hospitalizations seem to be rising again, and it's all because of these new subvariants. BA4 and BA5 were formally designated to be variants of concern by the World Health Organization, and that means they're either more transmissible, more severe, or reduce the effectiveness of public health measures such as vaccines, or a combination of those things. So basically, they have advantages that the other variants or subvariants don't. BA5 has already taken over as the most dominant sub-variant in Australia, accounting for approximately half of the sequenced COVID cases at the start of July. BA2, in comparison, accounted for about 40%. For a virus, it's all about the survival of the fittest. Its number one goal is to infect as many people as possible over and over again. But each time a new copy of the virus is made, there's a chance that an error will occur. A bit like a typo in its genetic code. Some of those typos or mutations are actually very useful to the virus, allowing it to infect more people and outcompete other versions of the virus. It's a bit like what happens with the flu virus or other coronaviruses. To do that, to get around immunity, the virus only has to be different to what it was before. And SARS-CoV-2 is very good at doing exactly that. Just how quickly it can change depends on two things. How susceptible the structure of the virus is to change and how many people it comes into contact with. RNA viruses like influenza and coronaviruses are already more susceptible to mutation. And that's because they don't have the ability to correct errors when they replicate, while most DNA viruses like herpes or smallpox do. But SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses are usually an exception to that rule, mutating at least four times slower than influenza because of a proofreading enzyme that helps it to avoid errors when replicating. Even so, we've seen a large number of mutations because of the sheer number of people who've been infected. SARS-CoV-2 is actually pretty stable, but when you have what we have at the moment, which is globally many, many infections, essentially what happens is that you're upping the odds that any mutation that the virus happens to pick up that gives it some sort of advantage, whether it's the ability to escape from our immune responses or the ability to transmit faster, any of those advantages um, becomes magnified. We've had Alpha, Beta, Delta, Omicron. What you're seeing here are just the ones that the WHO has monitored. By not reducing the number of infections um, that are occur occurring globally, essentially we're giving the virus every opportunity to, to pick up mutations and to evolve into a variant of concern. And that's because all around the world, and even in Australia, the number of people coming into contact with the virus is staggering. 
A new study found at least 46% of Australian adults had been infected by COVID-19 by early June. The prevalence of infection had almost tripled since late February, when it was estimated to be 17%. It's been a similar story right around the world. Every encounter with a person gives the virus just a little bit more of a chance to mutate even further. And without fail, the virus has produced variants that have eclipsed the old ones many times over. Omicron in particular has managed to dominate the case numbers and took over from Delta as the reigning variant in Australia back in January. The first version of Omicron, known as BA1, had dozens of changes in its genetic makeup. BA2 came quickly afterwards with enough genetic typos to get around our immune defences. And then came the most distinct versions, BA4 and BA5. In the US, it took just three months for BA5 to take over from BA2 as the dominant variant. Now, the biggest difference in the variants is in the spike protein. The more a spike protein changes, the less able our antibodies are to recognise them and neutralise them. That's because when people either get vaccinated or infected, they develop antibodies that can neutralise the virus by sticking to its spike proteins. Now, the spike protein is what allows the virus to recognise and infect our cells. But BA4 and BA5 have several mutations that make the shape of their spikes no longer recognisable to our antibodies. That's why our antibodies are about three times less potent against BA4 or BA5 compared to the original strain of Omicron. To put that in perspective, our antibodies were much worse, up to 40 times worse at neutralising the original Omicron compared to the original coronavirus. They are more transmissible um, than some of the earlier variants. They're also extremely good at uh, resisting our antibodies. Uh, they're the most antibody resistant uh, variants that we've seen so far. So we're more vulnerable than ever before. Even those people who've managed to avoid COVID up till now will find it much harder to keep it away. And those who've already had COVID, well, you're more likely to get reinfected. The consequences of reinfection are still the subject of debate in academic circles. Most people will be infected by Omicron, um, but a minority of those people will have a second infection. In terms of what the outcome from a second infection versus the first infection, there's no data to suggest that there's more severe outcomes following a reinfection. But that doesn't mean the risk of long COVID is something we should ignore. One study suggested that about 5% of vaccinated people infected with Omicron and its variants developed long COVID, compared to 11% of people infected with the Delta variant in 2021. There's less variability by variants compared to the variability that you see through vaccination status. In the unvaccinated era, we saw many patients with long COVID. So there's no doubt that the prevalence or the risk is coming down, the individual risk, but because there's so many infections, the burden of long COVID is clearly increasing. Australia is just at the beginning of its BA5 wave, so to understand how it might play out, let's go to a country that's already been through it. Early data from South Africa shows that BA5 grew at a much faster rate than the Omicron variant that preceded it. But the actual number of cases and people who got severely ill or were hospitalised wasn't as high as the Omicron surge. Researchers narrowed down the reason for that and they think it's because there were just higher levels of immunity than before. What we saw in South Africa was a very, very low number of hospitalisations. We saw this wonderful disconnect between the number of infections that we were seeing, which was high and probably undermeasured, and the number of hospitalisations, which was low. Before BA4 and BA5 became dominant in South Africa, 98% of the population was estimated to have had some antibodies from vaccination or previous infection or both. But that wasn't the case in Portugal. With the rise of BA5 in early May, hospitalizations rose almost to the level of the first Omicron wave. Some experts think it might be because South Africa's population is generally much younger than Portugal's. but it's too early to say for sure. What we have seen uh, in this current wave is that uh, the rise is much more faster than what we have seen in the previous two waves. Now BA5 is not the only member of the Omicron clan that's causing concern. 
There's also BA 2.75, first detected in India, and it seems to be spreading at a much faster rate than BA 5, almost comparable to the very first Omicron strain. The point is that the variants and the subvariants just keep on coming, and these won't be the last we'll have to deal with. Unfortunately, I think it's going to go on for, for, for quite some time. I think we're stuck with this pandemic. And as long as there's a high level of community transmission, we're going to see new variants emerging the whole time. So if we can't stop it from mutating, we have to give it fewer places to mutate. And that means two things, propping up our own immunity and slowing down the spread of the disease. In terms of immunity, there are large pockets around the world where people are still unvaccinated. In Australia, the uptake of the booster vaccine has been slow. The 71% nationwide rate of people who've received a third dose remains much lower than the 96% who've had two doses. And then there's the problem of the vaccines that we do have being based on an older variant. They work extremely well still at preventing severe disease. And, and keeping people out of hospital. Preventing people from becoming infected is just becoming really a much harder thing to do as more and more variants of concern come out. Studies are showing that antibodies triggered by vaccination are much less effective at attacking the BA4 and BA5 variants than they are at attacking earlier Omicron strains like BA1 and BA2. It's these two mutations in the variant's spike protein that are to blame for that. One solution proposed for this is a variant-specific vaccine. Pfizer and Moderna are due to release one soon in the US and the European Union. The risk with that is that, is that we may be sort of variant chasing forever. We could just go around and around in circles because creating a variant-specific vaccine is time-consuming. And by the time it's rolled out, another variant's popped up. So we're aiming for a constantly moving goalpost. The virus might eventually get milder and milder, but it's not going to be this month or next month or next year. Um, at the moment, we can't predict what might come out. Whatever that new variant is may be completely unrelated to the variants that we've seen circulating at the moment. So it's very difficult to, to predict where we're going. Instead, we could develop vaccines that generate antibodies against a broad variety of variants. A sort of pan-coronavirus vaccine in combination with a broad range of treatments and, as experts suggest, public health measures to lessen the number of infections. COVID means that we can't ignore it. <laughs> We've got to accept that COVID is part of our lives and adapt to it. And the adaptation, I think, is going to vary in different, at different times. But there's one problem with all of this. How much more would people be OK with compromising on their freedoms? What would you tolerate? That is a question science can't really answer. Look at it this way, we've had a shift in our baseline. Early on in the pandemic, we would have never accepted the number of cases we've seen over the past few months. But it's also coincided with higher rates of vaccine coverage and natural immunity. There's the risk though, that with transmission rates this high around the world, the next variant is more likely to arrive sooner rather than later and could, by all estimations, be more severe than the last. So it seems this is what living with COVID means, this constant balancing act between immunity and variants. Over time, we will get better and better at living with it, which means better tools. We will have better vaccines. We will have better antivirals. We will get more comfortable with the sort of public health measures that will have to be brought in. So I actually am optimistic about the future. I think we will learn to live better with COVID, but it's not going to go away. But that would also mean years, maybe decades, of people getting sick, missing work, getting seriously ill, dealing with long COVID, and that is not ideal for any of us. So should we still care about preventing infections? Well, it's up to us to decide how big or small that risk is and what we do about it.